Thanks. Hi, I'm Lucy Simcoe from the University of Washington. Security is important for everybody, but specific populations can have specific needs. And in this work, I'm going to focus on computer security and privacy for refugees in the US. To get started, there are about 22 and a half million refugees in the world currently. And in 2016 alone, about 85,000 were newly resettled to the US. And since 1980, about 3 million have been resettled to the US. I started getting interested in this topic because I was volunteering with local refugees and recent immigrants in Seattle, and I noticed that many of them had challenges with and needs for computer security and privacy that I hadn't considered before. In Seattle, I mainly worked with refugees from Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Syria, and Iraq. So now I'll move on to our research questions and methodology and give you a sense of the scope of the study. Security is fundamentally important for anyone who might be using computers. So seeing that refugees had challenges with certain security mechanisms and tasks inspired this research. The first question we asked was how resettled refugees use technology in general. We also asked specifically what security and privacy practices and mental models they have, and then use both of those to better understand the barriers that they face. And finally, we wanted to understand how their practices and mental models are shaped by the people who help them. So first, we conducted semi-structured interviews with employees of a local NGO dedicated to helping refugees and immigrants. Then we conducted focus groups with refugees through an interpreter. And finally, we coded the interviews and focus groups with separate code books to identify themes and address our research questions. Our study was approved by UW's IRB, and we took specific measures to protect the privacy and security of our participants. Like we asked them to anonymize the names in their stories, and we redacted personal data from the transcripts. In the interviews and focus groups, we talked about how refugees use technology, what their threat models are, and how they get help with technology. We asked participants about these topics both now and before coming to the US. For the employees, we were asking for their perceptions of all of these. The employees we talked to work closely with refugees every day, and the answers between the two groups were consistent. Now I'm going to turn to our results. I'll use an example scenario to illustrate many of the results, so please read the paper for more. We did, nine, we did interviews with nine employees from the NGO, four ESL teachers and five case managers who mainly focus on getting their clients jobs. And I use the terms clients and refugees interchangeably throughout the talk since that's what the participants did. Following the interviews, we had three focus groups, one with four refugees from Syria who are relatively new to the US, and we had two groups, each with five Somali refugees who had been in the US for much longer on average. And broadly, we found that refugees face many barriers, both technical and non-technical, in implementing secure practices. The barriers we saw were pervasive throughout many stories we heard from our participants, but I'm going to present these results by walking through one scenario. The scenario I'm going to talk through might seem mundane, checking your email in a browser, but it's a representative illustration of how there are a lot of hidden barriers that cause refugees to implement security practices that might stand out to us, the security community, as suboptimal. But remember that these practices currently exist for a reason. Because of a variety of challenges, they're the best option that the refugee sees available to them. Opening an email in a browser is something that refugees might do when they're looking for a job. And specifically, they might want to do it on the computer so that it's easier to follow links or fill out applications or forms that get emailed to them. The steps I'll talk about are first accessing a computer, then authenticating, then probably resetting the password, and then reading the emails. I'm including reset password in here as a point of discussion, but also because our participants said this was a really common problem. So the first step in checking your email in a browser is just getting to a computer. While most refugees in the US have smartphones, they typically do not have computers at home. Although some refugees are experienced smartphone users, they may not have much computer experience. And others, typically those who spent many years in a refugee camp, may be relatively new to smartphones as well as completely new to computers. So one thing that's fundamental to understand refugees' use of technology is that they have diverse technical experiences and therefore diverse threat models. Some arrive in the US never having used a computer or mouse, and they're just learning smartphones. And others are fluently using smartphones and social media. Because many refugees don't have computers at home, 
They typically use public computers at libraries and community centers. So one lesson is that public computer security is very relevant to this population. I'm gonna put little summaries of these challenges on the right-hand side because they interact with each other and it's helpful to see them all at once. When it comes to email usage, it's a new technology for most refugees. They mostly use email for job search purposes at first. Many employers communicate only over email and a lot of job applications are much easier to fill out online rather than visiting the company in person to get an application and then filling it out at home and visiting again to bring it back. But email being a new technology demonstrates that tech fluency can be a fundamental issue. This is from a case manager. Somebody that comes from a refugee camp, you have to explain to them what email is. What does it do for you? How do you communicate with people that you don't see but you're still talking? What kind of information should I share with them? This quote points to the security implications around issues with tech fluency. It's really hard to teach appropriate threat models in the beginning. Okay, so let's assume they've gotten to a computer, opened a browser, and made it to the URL of their email provider. I'm gonna move on to the second stage, authentication. Now they have to enter their username and password. If they aren't comfortable using a keyboard, it'll be hard to enter a password, especially if the characters are hidden, so you can't see when they make a mistake. Tech fluency is different implementations. For some, it's that they've never used email, and for others, it's that they've never used a keyboard and a mouse. But it all has security implications. For example, if they're not comfortable using a keyboard and creating capital letters, they might create a password with less entropy. Even if typing the password isn't the problem, remembering it might be a problem. Teachers and case managers said that forgotten passwords were very common amongst their clients. I'm gonna call this information overload. This is a quote from a case manager. So the last thing they want to remember is numbers, passwords, usernames, all this is new to them. And to add to that, it's a different language. So it's really a challenge. And in general, there are two main ways to solve forgotten passwords. And the first one is simply resetting the password. So how do you reset a password? It depends on the platform, but it requires verifying your identity some other way. One common way is through security questions, maybe about your mother's maiden name, your favorite color, or something from your childhood, like the name of the street you grew up on. But what happens if women from your culture don't take their husband's last name? What if you're just learning English and you don't know a lot of color names? Or what if the village you grew up in didn't have street names? Security questions make cultural assumptions like this, which makes it really hard for refugees to use them as authenticators. This is a theme that occurs with other defenses as well, which we'll see more of later. Here's a quote from a teacher about security questions. It says, for a newcomer, they might not be used to keeping that kind of information in their head. So I think that they might make up answers and then forget or forget what the question was asking. In this quote, the teacher is talking about how not only are the security questions not well suited to many refugees' background and culture, but some refugees may not even remember their answers. Moreover, these questions might just seem like another request for information in the never-ending stream of questions from authority figures. One thing that comes out of this is that knowing what personal information to share and keep secret and even to remember is cultural knowledge. When we give advice like never give out your social security number, it's not really what we mean. We mean don't give out your social security number except to people who need it. But people who need it, what does that mean? The DMV, your doctor, your phone company, someone who calls and they say they're your phone company, it gets complicated. And it's something that's really hard for refugees to navigate with a lot of personal information, like name, address, email address, phone number, et cetera. Another way in which security mechanisms require culture knowledge is birthdays. Many refugees come from cultures where birthdays aren't as important as they are in the US. So they don't know their birthday. When they get to the US, they're often assigned or they choose a birthday of January 1st. They still might have trouble remembering the year, and if they have kids in the US, they might not always remember their kids' birthdays, which is implications in many places. Like when people tell you to use your kids' birthdays as a symbol password, or when you're filling out paperwork about your family, or when someone runs a background check using only your name and your birthday and maybe the state. So one high level lesson here is that birthdays don't work as authenticators. It's a questionable practice to begin with, but it's even worse for refugees. For one, because they may not remember their exact birthday, and because even if they do, 
a disproportionate number of them have birthdays legally marked as January 1st, which means that security mechanisms that rely on a random distribution of birthdays won't provide much security. Okay, so birthdays aren't good authenticators. Back to password resets. Another way to prove your identity is to use a second factor, like a text to your phone. Many refugees have two-factor enabled and can use it to get back into their accounts. So this is actually a positive example of having access, trustworthy access to the right technology, their phone, and being able to use that technology. Another possibility, which we heard about, and thankfully it was rare, was getting locked out of the account forever and completely losing access. So there's actually usually another option for getting your password back, which is hoping that it's stored somewhere else, or in this case, that someone else knows it. Most of the time, the case manager actually has access to the email account because they check it regularly for job search emails. So often, the client can just ask their case manager for their password. I'll talk a little bit more about this relationship with the case manager and passwords later on, but for now, I'm just going to mark it as another challenge that refugees depend on others, in this case, the case managers, for help with technology. And this creates an interesting, interesting trust dynamic. This is from a case manager talking about how they respect their client's privacy. When I check my client's emails, they're sometimes sent from friends back home. I don't care about them. I look for ones that are job related. I can tell when they're personal. But not all refugees always want to trust their case managers. This is from a Somali refugee. She said, Everything has risks. Social workers, case managers, whoever you share information with, you have no idea what they would do with that information. But if you don't provide your information, you can't get what you're trying to get from them. It's a gambling situation. This is interesting because it points out that refugees have to trust their case managers because they depend on them. So they're sometimes forced to put security second. I want to note that we don't have any reason to think that the case managers we talk to aren't trustworthy but that I'm talking about the refugees threat model here, whether or not it's accurate, and how they can't always make security their primary goal. So let's move on and assume they've reset their password or gotten it from their case manager. Now that they've finally made it into their email, there's the same problem that many people face of how to determine whether an email is legit. This is not just a problem for refugees, but because of some of the barriers I've already talked about, this might be harder for them. And it also brings up a new challenge that scamming and identity theft may not have been a threat in their country, so it's a new threat that they haven't figured out how to deal with yet. This also relates to website legitimacy. It's also not unique to refugees, but case managers and teachers emphasize that their clients needed to be more careful when entering information online. When we talked to case managers and teachers about how they decided whether a website was legit, they didn't mention standard technical security measures like browser indicators that are looking for HTTPS. So this indicates dependence on others and also tech fluency, but it's the tech fluency of both the refugees and those, that, who, those who help them with tech issues, like case managers and teachers. One case manager said that they told their client to have some sort of physical verification of a URL, like a business card. The quote says, I googled it, the nearest address of that company. I told him, this place is a 15-minute drive from here. I give him directions. I mean, I printed out the map. Then I told him, you can drive to the address, you can go in, and you can ask them for their business card. Or you can ask them how to apply on the website. If you get it from them, it's trustful. This illustrates issues with tech fluency. There might be a better way to figure out if a website is safe. But it's an interesting example of a non-standard defense working around tech fluencies and not making cultural assumptions. So this is the end of my email scenario. And I hope that you now understand that something like logging into email on a computer which I don't personally find stressful, can bring up a number of hidden challenges for people like resettled refugees. I'm going to briefly talk about a few other scenarios, but please read the paper for more information. In my email scenario, I brushed, I brushed over the fact that case managers have access to their clients' email addresses. This means they need to manage all the passwords. They have to log into 40 to 50 emails every day to check for important emails. Sometimes they have to remind their clients of the password, and they have a lot of other work to do. They're also not security experts, so they are all respectful of their clients' privacy. We heard of a couple password management solutions from case managers, for example, writing credentials on a piece of paper and locking that piece of paper up at night, which is from a case manager who is really very security conscious, but they also didn't have a lot of clients who needed help. Another one was storing a plain text spreadsheet of email credentials, and then another person just gave every email the same password, since they were the one creating the email in the first place. 
So it's important to understand that this setup works, works for the relationship that exists. It lets the case managers efficiently log into many accounts, give the simple and easy to type password to the client when necessary, and it lets both of them log into the account on any computer, including a public computer, where you wouldn't want or you wouldn't be able to put a password manager. So while at first we wanted to suggest they use a password manager, and this still might be a partial solution, it's really telling that there isn't a tool out there that I'm aware of that will fit the needs of this relationship, despite the fact that the clients are using email for sensitive activities like job applications. So advice like don't share your password with anyone doesn't work when you need tech help. And this is also a really strong illustration of how security comes second to utility. This is an interesting contrast to other situations, like what I just talked about, where someone is putting security second. This is from a Somali refugee who does the opposite and goes to great lengths to be secure. In person, yeah, if it's an office, I try to visit way ahead of time. If it's making a payment, I like to visit the actual location I need to send my, pay my payments to, instead of doing it online or over the phone. Because even over the phone, you have no idea what they're gonna do with that. Scary thing. And finally, a big theme in this talk has been lack of tech fluency. But I don't want you to think that it's as simple as just holding a class or two. Refugees are very busy people with a lot of other things going on. This is from a case manager. <clears throat> They're adults. It's very hard in one shot to convince them that this is very important for their life and day-to-day -day life. Just only delivering that information doesn't make them change. It has to touch their heart and their soul. They have to feel it. Just giving them one lecture about the use of computers, it has to go beyond that. So that's the end of our results. To summarize, we conducted semi-structured interviews and focus groups to learn about the security and privacy needs and uses of resettled refugees. And there are three high-level insights. First, refugees overlap with some other communities and face a variety of barriers in implementing strong security practices. Second, many security mechanisms require cultural knowledge or make cultural assumptions. And finally, security isn't always a priority, sometimes because it's not in their threat model, and sometimes because other challenges are preventing them from being secure. Um, so big thank you to my co-authors, Ada, Samia, Franzi, and Yoshi. Thanks. Robert Ervis uh, from Idaho National Laboratory. Did you find any culturally neutral security controls from your interviews? Um, off the top of my head, I don't think so. Thanks. Um, there may be some out there. But... Oh. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, great talk. I enjoyed Thank the work. Uh, do you have any intuition about if there are unique challenges uh, from refugees from different locations, so if Syrian refugees versus Somali refugees face unique security challenges? Yes, I think so. Um, I think it depends a lot on the tech experience that they had in their home country. And one thing that I didn't talk about in the talk, but that's in the paper, is kind of this fear of surveillance that people from some countries have. So for example, we heard that Somali refugees were not afraid of surveillance in their country, um, but Syrian refugees were, Iraqi refugees were. So I think that kind of one thing we heard was that they got to the US and they thought, oh, I'm safe here, I can say anything I want, and it kind of, all of that fear disappeared for the very most part. So I think that kind of builds into the threat model somehow. Yes, for sure. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Rob Cunningham from MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Thank you very much for that beautifully delivered talk. Um, I had a question, though, about how the case workers themselves are educated about security. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe make a suggestion or two about how it should be changed? I think it depends greatly on the organization. The one we worked with, um, I think it's kind of ad hoc. I think they do have security briefings, um, maybe from their IT staff, but I don't think they, uh, they have um, an ethics, they have ethics rules, um, but I don't think there's anything kind of organized that they have, that I'm aware of. But we also didn't talk a whole lot about that with them. Thank you. Hey, this is, Really interesting from a point of view of the, the especially the culture aspect of things. Um, have you looked at the, or are you familiar with the falsehoods programmers believe set of lists? I'm not, no. I, I think this would be a very good uh, addition to that. It's basically a set of things. It started out with falsehoods uh, programmers believe about names, which is that you always have a first and a last name, that mm. kind of thing. Um, and so I wanted to maybe suggest 
adding some of these culture things to that list because I think this would be really valuable to get. I, I never thought about it, and like it would be really valuable to get out to the wider world. That sounds super interesting. I'd love to check it out. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So again, we are running out of time. Sorry. Maybe, yeah, just take it offline. Okay, let's, let's thank Lucy, Lucy again. <laughs>